so we are delighted uh, today to host uh, Douglas Ray as uh, this year's Henry L. Stimson uh, lecture. So the funding for this lecture series comes from an anonymous donor in honor of Henry L. Stimson, Yale College class of 1889, and that's a picture of him up here on the left. He was an attorney and a statesman who had a whole variety of uh, government service that culminated with his, secretary of, with his uh, tenure as Secretary of War during World War II, but also included uh, stints as a uh, US attorney, uh, governor of the Philippines, uh, Secretary of State, so a very varied and rich career. And since 1998, the Macmillan Center and the Yale University Press have collaborated to uh, use these lectures as a chance to bring uh, the most distinguished scholars and practitioners to Yale uh, to lecture on topics that we then publish as uh, books from the Yale Press. And recent Stimson lectures have included uh, talks by notable people such as uh, Michael Walzer, David Mayhew, Susan Dunn, uh, John Mary Schleimer, and I think last year we had uh, Ira Cass Nelson. So uh, tonight's speaker, Doug Ray, and I can tell from looking around the room that he is known to many of you, uh, he first came to Yale in 1967 as a junior faculty member in the political science department. He's had a truly uh, extraordinarily distinguished career on political and economic systems and has published very widely. The first book of his I read, I think, was The Political Consequences of uh, Electoral Laws, which is still um, you know, highly cited today, and a lot of numerous uh, articles and books along the way. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, you know, academic honors through the years. Um, too many to go through, but I'll just mention a few. He's an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a former Guggenheim fellow, a one-time fellow of Stanford Center for the Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and a fellow of the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. Now, we uh, celebrate the Stimson Lectures, somebody who has uh, follow the proud Yale tradition of uh, public service. And very often at Yale, we celebrate people who have performed that public service at the highest national reaches of the country. Uh, presidents, uh, Clinton, Bush one, Bush two, Secretary of State, Supreme Court justices, and so on. Um, Doug Ray's record of public service, I think, is something equally to be proud of, uh, but has lived very much at the local level. Uh, he's been a resident of New Haven for many, many decades, and in that time he has sought in ways large and small to improve the city and to improve the lives of uh, people in it. Um, he began in the uh, early 1980s, for instance, to start New Haven's first youth soccer league when he got tired of driving his kids uh, out to the suburbs and thought, why can't we make something like that here, accessible to all people from across the city? Um, that put him on uh, the map for some people as somebody who was interested in the city. And then he was um, contacted by uh, Mayor de Lieto uh, to join uh, the New Haven Commission on uh, Poverty, uh, where he again met other people in the city who recognized his uh, knowledge, his expertise, his people skills, and his genuine passion for improving the city. Uh, and that then put him on uh, the radar of Mayor John Daniels, the first uh, African-American uh, mayor of the city, who contacted him to be uh, chief executive officer, and uh, Doug took a public service leave uh, for a couple of years to serve in that administration. So this is somebody who, in many ways, in his uh, personal academic uh, life, has really tried to live up to that tradition of service and bring it home here in New Haven rather than outside, and that's something I think we should all be proud of. Um, tonight's talk is uh, something very different from, uh, from the New Haven environments that we might know him uh, through. He's uh, currently writing a book on American capitalism and teaching a course on this uh, topic. The overarching uh, title of the book project is Capitalism, Knowledge Drives Wealth, and uh, it's focusing on three themes. Uh, what the American founders got wrong, which is today's lecture, when markets force learning, America in the 19th century, which is the topic that we're going to uh, tomorrow, and now on Thursday, the finale is America's Unequal Capitalist Republic, which will be the last lecture, and I hope you join us for all of them. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, my department colleague, Doug Gray. I should begin with two con 
confessions, or perhaps more. Uh, first, tonight's lecture, we'll get at, at the end of tonight's lecture, we will get to the things the founders got wrong. It, when I sat down to do it, I realized that that story belongs in the middle rather than at the very beginning. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you what I hope is a uh, an interesting story about the consequences of adopting a capitalist economy. Um, second, the slides are surreal. Um, I was warned by my good friends in the in the teaching staff that the slides should be reviewed carefully before before we begin but I ignored that good advice <laughs> and uh, I think all the all the words are right some of the pictures are simply absent My, if I got we got them all back you're brilliant thank you um, I want to begin with well, what's indicated by the slide, a prologue, a very brief one, about uh, the, the time in early, early modern, late medieval, early modern times, when intellectually almost everything wonderful happened in a very brief period. Um, this is my A list for, I'm calling this the green period. Uh, so that I don't have to distinguish between all the wonderful things listed here, uh, which uh, represented an enormous flowering of <laughs> an enormous flowering of uh, intellectual brilliance and cultural innovation, which set the stage for the story we're going to tell. There are two things about the Green Period that uh, need mention. One is the brilliance of the intellectual production. The other is that they hadn't yet begun to tear the world apart. The natural environment of the planet was by 1750 pretty much what it had been a thousand years before. Uh, technology was shallow in the imprint it made on Earth's crust. Uh, the atmosphere remained about uh, the degree of concentration of carbon which it had had for 800,000 years before 1750. I actually have a slide to demonstrate that uh, or to demonstrate to, to assert that. I, can, I can't quite say it demonstrates it. Um, so we, when capitalism takes hold in the late 18th century, it inherits an enormous uh, commonwealth of intellectual and cultural uh, artifacts of enormous lasting value uh, and a relatively clean slate in the natural environment. It changes both of those things. Uh, during the, the green period, this is what I meant by slow-moving technology, which uh, scratches the earth only a few inches deep, maybe a foot. Um, the idea that dilution was a solution to pollution, that just flushing things into rivers was a an effective and responsible thing to do with chemical and biological waste. Uh, and <laughs> capitalism, capitalism changed all that in a huge way. It created, well, here we go. This is the thesis of tonight's talk. Take a second, I, I won't, recite it for you. Well, yes, I will. <laughs> uh, capitalism cor corresponds with increasing civility, uh, great, great, a great surge in incomes and 
wealth accumulation, a quirky increase in the apparent intelligence of children. Um, we'll explore that. And deeper than that is a social intelligence carried by market economies, making it unnecessary for each individual to master all the things which will shape her life and enrich her life. Um, and finally, dirtier. Uh, capitalism has been hell on the natural environment. And the recovery from that will uh, place great strain on market and government institutions. Uh, and the reason to talk about what the founders got wrong in the second lecture, and just to begin it tonight at the end of the lecture, is that what they got wrong is they created a defensive armature around national power, which made it easy to defend any status quo arrangement however wasteful, however unfair. And we are going to have to make much more substantial changes than our Constitution encourages uh, uh, going forward. Uh, finally, and it would be dishonest not to put this right at, right at the beginning, capitalism generates huge inequality, and in the American case, very huge inequality. Uh, economic insecurity for millions of people. Incidentally, federal judges and university, senior university faculty are two groups immune from that insecurity <laughs> and should never be listened to by anybody who works on a contract uh, with a length of less than 50 years. Um, it's, very, it, it's an astonishing privilege that universities grant uh, faculty who hang around long enough. So let's get on with it. Uh, first of all, what's capitalism? I put down uh, five markers here, uh, beginning with the observation that capitalism is a way of arranging society within a government. Capitalism, the Ayn Rand ideology of libertarianism has seized an opposition between government and capitalism. Uh, the way things actually play out, capitalism is a program for government. It is, in many respects, a hands-off or laissez-faire program, <coughs> though not in all. And the central working of capitalism would, uh, would be infeasible without the powers of government. Here I'm quoting Adam Smith, uh, the affluence of the rich excites uh, the indignation of the poor. And it is, uh, well, I, the, the capital sin in PowerPoint world is to put a thousand words on the board and then read them to people. Uh, wealth is unsustainable. Substantial wealth is unsustainable, unsustainable in the absence of the monopoly on force which governments provide to the holders of that wealth. And this is this is a plain fact recognized from the very beginning of the liberal theories about capitalism. John Locke, for example, saw property as the essential ingredient in the construction of uh, civil society and the state. Well, I'm rubbing the point in here for Smith. Uh, it's a huge point, though, and ideologically, it is where I at least part company with uh, libertarian thinking. I, I have libertarian tendencies. How many, 
Wave if you've ever had a libertarian reaction to some piece of legislation. <laughs> I think all of us have. Um, and as long as it's piecemeal and we don't get around to philosophical anarchism, which would be insufferable and intolerable and would uh, render all of us uh, in, in a state of poverty. Uh, second main feature is that the means of production are privately held, or most of them are privately held. I mean, quite often there will be publicly owned utilities. Uh, there are in many cases uh, publicly owned um, airlines and railroads, uh, but the capitalist, the, the chemistry of a capitalist society depends on there being a large uh, seg sector which is governed privately and is governed without necessary attention to the present, the present agenda of the state with a degree of independence there. We'll get to that momentarily. <clears throat> uh, firms, the third feature is that firms are free to decide what they produce, how they produce it, and who they employ in producing it, and how they go about marketing it. So there's chaos out there. There is a considerable degree of chaos in any healthy capitalist economy. Uh, I note here, if you look at the letter, C, the, the letter C at the top, uh, the power of Microsoft, which is near, very nearly a monopoly, includes the right to prevent my combining the parents with the letter C. <laughs> you can all try it. If you type paren C paren, you get trademark, copyright rather. Uh, and so far as I know, there's no, is there, Barry Nailbuff probably knows if there's a workaround, is there? It escaped access. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I was able to, I, it's a pretty good bet about you. <laughs> um, free labor is another of the defining tenets. Uh, and the beginning of the American story, of course, is entirely deficient in that respect. Uh, slave labor is uh, wholly inconsistent with the internal working of capitalism, though Southern slave labor played a huge role in supplying the European textile industries, the Manchester uh, cotton mills, which were so important uh, in the 18th century at the time of the American founding. Uh, as I say in the, at the bottom of the slide, the German word Vogelfrei, uh, free as a bird, is used by Marx and Marxoids uh, to breathe irony on the concept of free labor. If the best job available to me as a free worker is a dreadful job badly paid, I am free like a bird, perhaps, but I am not free as a man most, most properly ought to hope to be. Um, <clears throat> finally, among the, uh, the defining characteristics is a whole apparatus for the accumulation and distribution of knowledge. Uh, universities are part of that. Uh, Yale is assuredly part of that. Uh, all public charities, all 501c3 organizations, which are exempt from much, most taxation, are part of that. And the real functioning of the economy depends on an educational system which produces a flow of people with appropriate knowledge and appropriate training. Uh, and the wealth, this is the, if there's one overarching point in the Stimson lectures I'm giving, it is that the ultimate basis of society's wealth is the accumulation of practically valuable knowledge 
and the recombination of that knowledge in a continuous process of innovation. Um, the name Harkness in Yale's Harkness Tower, as I say here, rhymes with Standard Oil. Uh, Stephen Harkness was in the original group of seven who were partners before Standard Oil uh, became a company. So to sum up, one of the, the, this one was highlighted with yellow and the machine decided to get rid of that and maybe it was right. Oh no, there it is. Um, so these are the things I think are important, not as defining characteristics of capitalism, but as consequences or cor correlates, not necessarily entirely caused by capitalism. Indeed, in some ways, the causal arrow may, may point in the opposite direction. For example, uh, it is very difficult to operate in a market economy if you are not reasonably civil. And that will tend over a period of generations to shape your behavior so that uh, if not you, then your children and grandchildren uh, learn a degree of civility which allows them to function in a market system. So civility. Uh, it has uh, wide and narrow meanings. I have in mind two different strands. One of them is uh, refraining from violence. Uh, Another is good manners, uh, acting respectfully toward other people. <laughs> uh, there, w when I say this, it's a statistical generalization. <laughs> and like all other statistical generalizations, it's partly false. Um, that is not his middle finger, I have determined. <laughs> um, here's the, the more nuts and bolts. This is from Steven Pinker's wonderful book, uh, The Better Angels of Our, uh, of Our Nature, which is a 600 year history of violence, mainly in the Western world, but also worldwide. And uh, these are, notice that it's a, um, the scale is exponentially graded, it's a log scale, so that the distance between 100 and 1,000 is given the same space as the difference between 1 and 10. Uh, the, this is an exceptional, the US was an exceptional place, and there were local pockets of very high violence in our early history. Uh, the Tennessee Kentucky border country, uh, Harlan County, uh, extremely high rate of violence. The big curve in this chart is Virginia and the Chesapeake, where uh, the rate of violence goes from being um, pretty high to that is 100 per 100,000 or one per thousand. Uh, down to being uh, something like what it is today. Uh, this is a broader look, uh, also from Pinker. Um, and the trend line for Western Europe is representative of what we're talking about. And the downward part of it that comes after 1648 and the Treaty of Westphalia, when the nation state system took hold of Western Europe in a quite vigorous way. I didn't mean to flip that. Well, uh, and the, the association between uh, desisting from violence and capitalism is, uh, again, I don't see it as a one way correlation uh, but it is definitely there in the right-hand half of this chart. Uh, this is another 
Um, another piece of research, Manuel, Manuel I, Eisner, who is a Cambridge Don, uh, does statistical work on the history of murder in European countries. And the, the Italians look pretty bad at the beginning and stay that way un, <coughs> until the middle of uh, this chart. Uh, but then by the end, the homicide rate in all these places has done the same thing. It has verged toward zero. And the functioning of the state in reducing homicide is a really important story. Uh, in pre-state societies, and even when there's a nominal state that doesn't have a real court system and a real police function, uh, even in such a state, uh, perhaps a third of all the homicides are committed as punishment for a prior homicide. So that Smith kills Jones's brother, Jones then kills Smith, and we have two homicides. Uh, whereas if it is prosecuted by the state and the punishment is less than hanging, uh, we have one homicide. Uh, and the, the concept of the people versus Jones or, or Smith in my example, the people versus this person, take it out of the binary conflict picture and make it one in which the act of homicide is seen as an aggression against the society at large. Um, now back to the civility, to the soft civility, the good manners side of this. Uh, St. August Augustine of Hippo um, believed in a basically zero-sum world. And so did almost everybody in that era. The idea that two people trading could both get to be better off by the trade which is foundational to a market economy, uh, was foreign to them. The notion that trading generated new value uh, was foreign and was a product of a later era, the one we're talking about. Uh, Norbert Elias, a German sociologist, uh, produced a, a book about that thick which was a history of manners. He called it the civilizing process. Uh, and it was a history of increasingly civil behavior in everyday life in German society. Um, this is an unfortunate, this is a Nuremberg war trial. Uh, the guy on the right is a German officer who is being tried for his life. And the person I'm interested in here is on his left and is uh, a, a guy named Albert Hirschman, who became a most distinguished economist, spending the plurality of his career uh, at Princeton. Uh, there, we'll frame him up and ignore the Nuremberg. Um, and the book I'm interested in here, it was called The Passions and the Interests. And it was a history of manners in Western Europe. Uh, more specific, more pointed, and I would say more insightful than the Elias history. Uh, in, and the, the example that jumps out for me is the concept of avarice. Uh, in the 17th century, avarice was considered the deadliest of the deadly sins, uh, the most wretched possible form of behavior was self-seeking about money. And by the 18th century, uh, avarice had come to be called interest, 
and was an accepted part of human behavior. It was what we expected others to do. There was no sense of sin about trying to make a good living operating a business or operating a professional office or inventing new stuff. Um, the fine print here mentions another Hirschman book called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, 1970, and I just wanted to mention that in 1969, when I was a wet behind the ears beginner, I had the privilege of an invitation from Hirschman to go with him and six other people to Italy and spend a week drinking very good wine and talking about the rough, rough parts in the manuscript for Exit Voice and Loyalty. Uh, its extraordinary quality had nothing to do with my contribution <laughs> or anything else said that week. Uh, but it was one of the better weeks of my academic life. <laughs> um, Samuel Johnson, uh, there are very few more innocent activities than getting money. Um, and I think that's true. I mean, as long as you're not scamming people, uh, making a, a quote unquote honest living is at the core of a capitalist society. Um, Montesquieu, Montesquieu is important for several reasons. One of them is that the American founders took him to be the state of the art on how to organize a constitution. And the three, the three way structure of our state is taken straight from Montesquieu's uh, spirit of the laws. Um, he makes the observation parallel to Johnson really uh, that there is a correlation between commerce and good manners or gentleness. Uh, the rise of the state, I already mentioned this. Um, I should rub in the idea that the state takes over the revenge motive uh, from civil society. In 15th century Europe, uh, any well-to-do gentleman would carry a dagger everywhere he went and would be prepared to use it if properly provoked. Uh, such behavior would, for this crowd, be implausible. <laughs> I carry a, a pocket knife I left at home tonight about that big, and it doesn't count. <laughs> Although TSA at the airport <laughs> will shamelessly confiscate it every time. Uh, richness and wealth. This is more what one would expect in this topic, and it is central. Uh, this is a diagram, um, famous, it's a rather famous diagram by um, Gregory Clark. Uh, he has a chapter which he calls a 16-page economic history of the world. And there's some irony in what he says. Uh, but income per person, where 1,800 is one unit on the vertical scale, uh, and he's generalizing about Western Europe here, uh, there is no systematic growth in the years before 1800. Clark rubs that in by saying that a working class person in England in that year uh, lived a harder life than a caveman 100,000 years earlier. And I, how would we verify that? I have no idea. Uh, their condition was uh, not, not soft or wonderful. The important part of his, of his chart is the near vertical swing, which uh, the economy of Western Europe took around the year 1800, and which has had an enormous um, 
an enormous impact on the planet and on the way people, people live today. Um, I'll drown you in statistics here. Uh, these are estimated uh, average GDP per capita, so the size, the total size of the economy divided by the number of people uh, for all these capitalist countries. And the, the U.S. is probably, our, probably your central focus. Uh, there is a huge increase in the economic activity occurring in a given year from starting in 1800 and finishing up in 200 years later in the, in the millennial year. Uh, it's a very steady story, and it's one which plays out in all these rich countries. What they have in common is that they all became capitalist by the midpoint of the 19th century. They became uh, capitalist and uh, as a result, on average, uh, much richer than they had been before. Now, uh, this is a chart about death rates and it ties into understanding the next stat I'm going to throw at you. The, the uh, time scale is from the year 1541 to the year 1975. Each dot is a year's overall death rate per thousand uh, in England. Uh, and the data are pretty good. They're surprisingly uh, reliable. The work in question was done by Robert Fogel at the University of Chicago. Uh, and the, the, the yellow zone is, roughly speaking, the capitalist era. It's the era where fairly well-developed state, state the, the state is rather well-developed or beginning to be, and the capitalist economy is beginning to grow rapidly. Uh, there are two obvious, obvious contrasts between the earlier period in white and the later period in yellow. Uh, and they're these, I believe. One is that there is no systematic trend in the death rate up to the transition. That is from 1541 to, let's say, 17. 50. Uh, there's fluctuation, but no systematic trend, or if there is a trend, it's flat. Uh, that's one point. The other is that death rates are highly variable in that period. You have uh, years where uh, death rates are above, we have one year where it's above 50 per thousand. 5% per year, that's a lot of death. Um, and it's not rare to get uh, above 35 or 40 uh, as a death rate uh, in that early period. Well, the second period has two differences, and they're the ones you would expect from what I just said. First, there is a systematic downward trend in the death rate. Death becomes less frequent. Uh, the rates fall from uh, the neighborhood of 30 per thousand or 3 percent to 10 or 15 per thousand or just over 1 percent. And modern death rates are lower than that, but not very much lower. That is 1975 here shows at about 10. And uh, there are very few uh, advanced economies where the death rate is a lot lower than 10 per thousand. Uh, the other is that the variation is gone. The, the, the dots are very closely packed around the trend line uh, from the late 1800s 
uh, to the end of the data. So that phenomena like plagues uh, and famine uh, are being driven out of the economy. Uh, people die, terrible things happen, but they don't happen on a mass scale in ways that are unexpected and unpredictable. Uh, this chart, this table rather, shows lifespan GDP per capita. So it takes into account both what the GDP is and how long you live. So that if someone was born in the year 1800 with a life expectancy of 40 years, we would add up an estimate of GDP for 1800, 1801, 1802, and so on for the 40 years of life expectancy. Take that sum and write it down here. Uh, the, the dramatic increase in these numbers uh, represent the combined effect of sustained economic growth and strongly increasing longevity or put backward, strongly diminishing death rates. Uh, the United States is not, to, not at the top of the pack, but near it. And, um, and is uh, fairly typical. Uh, you see two blank cells for the United States there. Can you take a guess what those might be? Why they would be there? There were no data about slaves. So computing the overall ra rate would be meaningless. Um, this chart is here just, uh, it's India, which is uh, in a period of enormous, uh, enormous growth from a very low base. And the worldwide story, uh, the reason globalization means the movement of uh, manufacturing jobs toward Asia and toward the Southern Hemisphere has everything to do with the fact that the capitalist, the capitalist surge is a hundred years later in those places than in the Northern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere in Europe and uh, the offshoots of Europe like, North, uh, like the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Um, and ultimately, one would suppose that there would be a convergence in uh, the degree of wealth between uh, the Western and Northern countries and the rest of the world. And the Chinese are peddling really hard uh, and using uh, fairly strong incentives to make that happen as fast as they can. Uh, smarts. People got smarter in the 20th century. This is a weird story. Uh, it's called the Flynn effect. Is, is, Flynn, is that a name any, anybody recognizes? Okay, the guy's name is James B. Flynn. He was a cognitive psychologist. Uh, and IQ tests, IQ, what's the average IQ of the test taking public? It's always the same, 100. And Flynn was involved in rewriting the tests from year to year. And they discovered a systematic trend. If they left the questions the same or changed the questions and made them the same degree of difficulty, IQs kept rising. It happened throughout the developed world. Uh, and it went on, it's no longer happening, but it went on for about nearly 50 years. 
uh, and it was substantial. The <coughs> fluid intelligence is not much influenced by schooling. It's giving people a pictorial matrix and having them analyze it and seeing how well they do at that. Um, and the rise was about 15 points per generation. So if you, if you take a generation to be 25 or 30 years, that's a pretty big shift in uh, what, what sounds to me like just raw smarts. Uh, and that's quite remarkable. Um, crystallized IQ means uh, using uh, established procedures like Algebra 1 or geometry or other, uh, other things that are taught in schools. Uh, and there, the effect of the Flynn effect was more modest. It was only about half or a little more than half what it was for fluid IQ. And the question, of course, becomes, why is this happening? And one thing I think we can rule out is evolution. Uh, the, the, this was a startling revelation to eugenicists. The eugenics people had the starting point that the, the observation, Francis Dalton, 1883, says, all the smart people are not having children or are having few children. And all these dumb people working in the factories are generating the next, gen the next generation of our citizens. What a horror. We will be dumber generation by generation. Uh, and as it happened, uh, the Flynn effect refutes that. There was no systematic dis dysfunctional uh, devolution. The, I don't know why this happened, uh, and nobody knows. The likeliest bet is that more kids were spending more years in school that's one. Two, that people got better about managing time and doing the test in a smart way where you quickly fill in what you know and don't spend time scratching your chin about things you don't know how to solve. Uh, another possibility is that with a culture has been shifted from a narrative focus to an analytic focus. A narrative focus understands any problem by telling a story in chronological sequence. A analytic focus does something very different and something much more like what IQ tests are interested in. So that's another of the possibilities. Um, This is a more, a more important point for our subject than the Flynn effect. This is F.A. Hayek. Uh, and this is something I believe is not only true, but profoundly true, is among the most important facts about a society like our own. It is that as the total commonwealth of knowledge is built up generation after generation and within generations year after year. Uh, the ratio between what is carried in any one cranium and what is available to that cranium when it listens to the world uh, is gets steeper and steeper. We are all relative to our time and place, more limited now than at any time in the past. Not because we have declined, but because the common wealth of knowledge around us has expanded exponentially 
at, it, it is expanding at a rapidly increasing rate every year. And when you read the scary stuff about artificial intelligence, um, the scary point is how much useful knowledge there is to plug into artificial intelligence, uh, even if its net generate, generation of new knowledge were negligible. Hayek is a wild-eyed market conservative, or was. Um, I met him once. He was in a wheelchair and was trying his best to be nice. Uh, I, I was many degrees of the compass too far left for his taste. Um, and still am, although I probably moved a degree or two his way. Um, so the, for me, the central point about smarts is social smarts, the smarts which are held in common across society, the knowledge, the how-to, the ability to construct and reconstruct better devices, better procedures, is now far greater than it was at any previous point in our history. Oh yeah, this is called, I, I don't have time to tell you this. I'll, I'll tell it to those of you who come next time. <laughs> no, no, hell, that's, a, that's bad behavior. That's uncivil. Uh, here it is. This is a story of, uh, written by a master's student at University College London who sets out to make a, an electric toaster from scratch and spends, I, I forget the number, I think it's about 50,000 pounds <laughs> and makes the object shown on the cover of the book, uh, which will get a little warm but will not toast bread. Uh, this is Hayek's point. Hayek's point is that the pooled knowledge which is out there and accessible to people making toasters and not, not accessible to people using toasters is of profound importance. And the way, we, the way we get on with our lives is to rely at increasing rates on knowledge generated by strangers for us and for millions of others like us. Uh, Ernest Gellner, uh, just I'm curious, how many of you have ever heard the name Ernest Gellner? Okay, people with a little sociology. Uh, he was one of the greats. He was an industrial sociologist. And uh, he makes this point. This is another way of making Hayek's point. It is that the vocabulary people in an industrial economy speak is different from the vocabulary of any other society or type of society and is better. Not more poetic, but better from a pragmatic point of view. From the point of view of getting from purpose to process to product. The vocabulary of an industrial society like our own is extremely powerful. Part of it is math, of course, but lots of it is not math, but words organized around the commonwealth of knowledge. Uh, I've been making uh, a just repeated uh, acknowledgments of. Um, I'm going to finish in four minutes. Um, the, there is a kind of self-generating evolution in the way a market works. And the importance of, the, of companies having free reign in choosing what they do and how they do it and who they hire to execute it 
uh, is important because it creates variation in the way people, the way, let's take toasters, the way people make toasters. Uh, I've actually gone to a, a store uh, that had 40 kinds of toasters. And they're all, they all are about the same idea, but they vary it in uh, sometimes uninteresting, <laughs> but sometimes interesting ways. And then the selection from past accomplishments that get folded into new things uh, is central to the way our society works. Uh, I made that chart, this chart last night. <laughs> I had had a, a tumbler of bourbon. <laughs> and I think maybe we'll just pass it. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, go to, I, I'll, I'll go to an example about selection. Uh, from the 1840s. This is when the railroads were suddenly becoming central to, to uh, the American economy, the British economy, uh, and several European, continental, continental European economies. And, and the story I, I'm going to tell you is about the U.S. And the strategy in the U.S. was to raise the capital and then throw rails out there, build uh, lots of trackage just to get the revenue started and do it somewhat helter-skelter. Uh, and they had trouble from that. Uh, they used wrought iron for the rails. Uh, and they uh, supported the rails on stone or cement. The ties, as we call them, were made of stone or cement or wood and wood won out. Why, do, why would wood have won out? Because they found a correlation. The rate at which the wrought iron delaminated and killed people, which it did often, it would, it would uh, just, it, just cease to be a unit. It would just splay out all over the place due to the weight of the trains. Uh, and the rate at which the wrought iron delaminated was lower with wooden ties because the ties were soft enough to absorb some of the pressure, uh, made wood the better product. Uh, soon after that, of course, they decided that wrought iron was the wrong product. And the steel industry was ultimately the result of that. And steel, which had been a monstrously expensive metal, uh, in 1840 became a commercially available and not terribly expensive uh, on the order of $30 a ton uh, two generations later. Oh, dirtiness. I'm, um, <laughs> uh, this is a picture of trash. Uh, this, this tells what it is. It's the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland on fire um, with the effluence from the oil refineries. Children living in a dump. Uh, Rachel Carson, Carson's uh, Silent Spring. How many of you read that book when it came out? <laughs> oh, I forgot. I'm the old, only old person here. Um, I'm the only. I, well, I was. I was a college senior when it came out, and uh, I actually didn't read it. I just read the reviews and got the point, which <laughs> is pretty powerful. The. Um, the larger point uh, is the carbon in our atmosphere. This is a, a chart generated by NASA. And I, 
and it covers 800,000 years uh, with the horizontal line representing the level at in 1950, the level of CO2. You see random fluctuation within tight limits for 800,000 years, and then you see it double, more or less, in a few generations. Uh, that should scare us all. Uh, and it will set a task for the next generation of people living in capitalist and industrial economies like our own. And I will stop there having exceeded my time limit already. Thank you. Q&A? Yeah, we've got time for about 20 we'll, minutes. We'll yeah. take a few questions for those who can remain. Are you going to give us any preview about the Constitution wrongness? Yeah, it, it is that um, the delegates from Virginia were the intellectual leaders. Um, Hamilton in New York was another. They were, here they were, these were two very prosperous colonies. And they were teaming up with 11 nondescript colonies. And they were going to throw their lot in with a national alliance of those 13. And they thought defensively. It was easy for them to imagine a coalition uh, which was adverse to their interests. Virginia, it was really easy because of slavery and abolitionism throughout the northern colonies. Uh, New York, which uh, under Hamilton's leadership was conspicuously fond of bankers and investors, or as they said, speculators, um, and they, they rigged the Constitution to make change slow and difficult. Separation of powers, uh, checks and balances. Uh, the, the core of the theory is in Federalist number 51. Uh, and I guess Federalist 51 and Federalist 10. 10 says, make the country as big and heterogeneous as possible so that nobody can organize a majority coalition. And that turned out to be a sounder bet in the 1780s than it has been at any time since. Um, so that's what they did. And the, the difficulty, the, the, the costliness and incoherence of policymaking where with something like health care uh, or climate change, you have to move the whole thing in a systematic way. The whole corpus of public policy has to shift in a coordinated way, which Obamacare, and I'm an Obama, guy, Obama fan, but Obamacare doesn't even begin to do it in a coordinated way. It does it in a completely uncoordinated way. And the Constitution made the task when they did the Obama Health Care Act almost impossible. They had to concede side payments to every imaginable interest group, most of all to the insurance industry, um, and created well, our health, who knows what percentage of our GDP goes to health care? Around 18. Uh, we're, we're spending about twice what we ought to be spending. And are we getting results that are even as good as the cheap skates in Canada? No. Um, our Constitution forces uh, to get any sustained change that's that complex is a very slow process and requires extraordinary leadership at many levels at once. Yes, Jeff. Well, what, how does science do 
fit into your big picture? How does science fit into your big picture? Uh, you it's in the everything with capitalism, but there's other things that went on over that 500 year period. One is science. I abso absolutely, and my, my A-listers included Francis Bacon, for example, for that reason. Um, the science is, well, the, there's a really interesting lab for this right now at MIT where they are doing venture capital starting with ideas from MIT's um, science people uh, trying to solve um, design and engineering issues an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude more difficult than we're used to. This is called the MIT engine. And is, uh, they for example, have a, they have started a new firm to do fusion energy, Commonwealth Fusion Company. Another company to make steel without all the energy and heat that is involved in every existing way of making steel. So they're taking big leaps. Um, the role of, uh, I mean, if you think about the transistor, for example, um, Bell Labs, uh, and then um, Sh William Shockley Associates, and then he alienated all his engineers at once and they went off to form Fairchild Semiconductor. I think that's the name. Um, and science is at the, at the very heart of that. And I think it's, it's woven through all this. I, I may have shortchanged it in the examples I selected. Sean. So these, these 250 years, that you discussed about capitalism also happened to coincide in large parts of the world with colonialism. How do you isolate whether it was capitalism or colonialism without comparing to the performance of okay, pre-1750 societies in the world and their wealth levels? And um, you will know that partly the green period is, is a gesture about covariance. Um, and the way I formulate it, it's not causal. It's not that capitalism causes civility, for example. Uh, it is equally the, the obverse, that civility promotes capitalism. Colonialism was on a, in aggregate, a terribly important way of extracting resources and cheap labor uh, from other societies. And I guess one way to put your question is, imagine that capitalism developed with no colonial, colonial umbrella around it. Could it have been what it is? And I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, if I were going to take a guess, I would say, yes, it could have done it. It would have done it in a different and probably inferior way, but it would have been something like what we're talking about. Yes? I have a question on China. Um, you gave us a great survey of the things that contribute to capitalism, and I was thinking many of them do relate to China. But how is our major competitor in the society that is growing economically so rapidly, what features is it missing? Is it at most of these features that you described? I think it has uh, all of them. It, it, the only way in which it is odd man out is the nature of its state is quite different. The Chinese state is utterly different from the Western states I was uh, mainly talking about. And for, I, uh, for 30 years, 
harbored the view that as the Chinese economy got more and more open, uh, more and more overtly capitalist, uh, that the government would be compelled to embrace a more open uh, system of governance. And quite the opposite has happened. Um, and I find that sad and, uh, and well beyond my understanding about why it broke in that way. Do you have a theory? Well, I was wondering on competition. You didn't really emphasize competition as a, as a characteristic of capitalism. I think of competition and capitalism. Do you, I, see I, that, do you see that in China? Do you see the competition? Obviously, the knowledge is great. But is it a competitive society as well? It's as competitive as they choose to let it be in any given instance. And you might say that about our society, by the way, these days. I mean, the very large platform companies uh, have inordinate market power. Um, Amazon and Facebook, for example, and one of the one of the examples about U.S. governance is antitrust, and the generally uh, unsuccessful uh, character of antitrust legislation. I mean, the the Sherman Act of 1890 had one effective consequence, which was the division of Standard Oil into 34 little companies in 1911 but nothing else. And there were lots and lots of monopolies and near monopolies in the period we're talking about. And the Congress never got around to making it uh, have teeth that would actually change monopolistic practices on a mass scale. Uh, the breaking up of Standard Oil had one consequence for John D. Rockefeller which was that it made him roughly five times richer than he was before the breakup. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you count that as a victory or not. <laughs> Probably not. I, I want to take you back to the comment about colonialism. And now, of course, we're in the global era. I, uh, are you leaving? Oh, you're coming up this way. I'm, just, I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> close. Okay. No, what I'm trying to figure out is when we calculate the size of a capitalist economy, you're looking at the metropole, but in fact, it's a much larger hinterland that's being involved. In fact, you don't even have to go into colonialism. If you look at all the extraction that needs to be done to make the components for all the electronic devices we use. We have a much larger world. So it's a little nice to say that the nice things happened in the metropole, but quite a lot of the waste and increased inequality, and in fact some extremely uh, awful things have been happening in the rest of the world. Now, if you were to put them all together and include the hinterland in the capitalist system, you might get a very different figure for how successful it is. So um, your facts are, I think, dead on. Uh, there is actually a very good book called The One Product, which is about the iPhone. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of that. And, uh, and the extractive network that puts that together from I don't know what it is, the raw there are hundreds of different metals and other raw materials that go into it. Um, and I would say, I certainly agree that a full analysis of capitalism would include uh, what you're calling the hinterlands or what Sean Sunder is has in mind for colonial societies like 19th century India. It's not decreased. Pardon? It's not decreased. In fact, it's probably going to increase as long as we have enough uh, place left in the world to extract from. Um, 
Well, I, it, it's an interesting question. I, my own intuition, and there's no serious research behind it, is that the role of most metals uh, will be diminishing over time going forward. The, pre the rare earths and certain other metals will remain very important and perhaps become more important and scarcer. Um, but the, move, the sort of heavy movement of stuff is a lower fraction now of the economy than it was at any previous time. The but the damage to the countries like the Congo is significant. They're going to pay the price for all the mountains that we're creating over here. Um, I don't I don't doubt the major point you have in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say so this actually connects a lot of these recent comments, which is that how much does this rise of capitalism, especially mature capitalism, how much does it depend on corporate structures? Um, and so how much is this a history of corporatization as opposed to markets? And is there a possibility for capitalism without, you know, global corporate structures? Uh, it's a good question, Charlie. Uh, the 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 corporation, of course, goes back to the very beginning. I mean, the East India Company was a, was a joint stock corporation. The Virginia Company was. The Massachusetts Bay Company was. Uh, so the, the, the freely minted corporation where some entrepreneurs without going to the government can sit down around a table the way the Standard Oil guys did in 1870. Uh, that's a recent phenomenon. That only starts about 1840 with the British Corporations Act and its analog in the American states. Um, no, I think the, the, the joint stock corporation and other structures a lot like it are pivotal to this. And if you took them away, people would people would have to invent something a lot like them that evaded the law. Um, the, well, I mean, if you think about the Standard Oil story, they created the trust to get around state laws. Uh, and it worked. It worked so well that ultimately they got the Sherman Act in 1890 which killed one company, didn't even kill it, just metastasized it, um, made it far less monopolistic. Except that John D. had a finger in all 34 pots. Um, well, thank you all for coming. <laughs>